Okay, so um, I'm gonna switch gears from the inner title and talk about kelp forest systems. And the presentation that I was originally supposed to give was titled Mapping Patch Dynamics for Multiple Data Sources. So I kind of uh, decided to shift gears a little bit instead of talking about a specific um, science question to sort of give an overview of kelp remote sensing and UAVs in kelp remote sensing today. And so I know a lot of the drone camp has been sort of like terrestrial focused. And so I, I just wanted to give the perspective of more of a marine, uh, fo marine ecosystem focus. So just to sort of take you from land to underwater um, and show you what a kelp forest is in case you haven't experienced it. Uh, Kelp forests are really important ecological systems in temperate uh, nearshore regions, and they support a variety of different uh, economically important fisheries, tourism, they support indigenous culture. And uh, so this is really sort of where kelp forests are important in our economy and in, uh, in terms of biology, but how does this relate to remote sensing? Because right now we're underwater, right? Not above water, which is where we use UAVs. Uh, so kelp forests are actually relatively easy to map um, compared to other marine and aquatic targets. And so there are actually a lot of challenges that uh, are associated with remote sensing of the marine and oceanographic environment that uh, we don't necessarily encounter in kelp forest systems. And uh, so that's why we say they're relatively easy to map. And so in the picture on the slide, uh, I'm just showing a kelp forest system in at Hopkins Marine Station in Pacific Grove. And really kelp stands out spectrally compared to the water surrounding it, which allows us to uh, detect it with remote sensing uh, relatively easily. So that's sort of where, um, where we're looking at kelp from a remote sensing perspective. And in this really high near infrared, re really high near infrared signal, uh, it's very applicable to other terrestrial systems, but now we're looking at it in a marine environment. And so much of the historical interest in mapping kelp forests came from its economic value. So even though I talked about the ecological value of kelp systems, the remote uh, monitoring of kelp across the last century really uh, was developed to understand how much uh, was there for harvesting by companies like Kelco. And that's kind of shown Kelco uh, harvesting kelp here in the upper right hand side. And um, you can see that kelp harvesting increased across the last century basically, but has uh, declined rapidly within the last 10 years or 15 years. And that's mostly because Kelco is gone and a lot of the harvesting is now primarily used for abalone uh, aquaculture. Uh, but historically, much of the statewide or, you know, uh, fisheries, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Washington, Oregon, uh, a lot of these states that have kelp monitoring um, infrastructure, it was driven by uh, how much do we, how much kelp do we have so that we can keep track of what is being harvested and how much is there to be harvest, harvested. Um, so more recently, within the last few decades, the remote sensing of kelp has really shifted to looking at the science of these systems at regional and patch scales. And so looking at dynamics across regional, um, regional areas, such as Northern California, uh, where uh, large scale kelp declines have uh, been observed and continue throughout uh, today. And then also looking at patch scale dynamics. So what's going on at the patch level um, and what kinds of physiological dynamics are happening? So senescent nutrient uptake, nutrient uh, content within blades um, of kelp blades. And these are collected from a variety of different sensors. So the figure on the left is from Landsat, which is, which is a 30 meter spatial resolution uh, satellite and then the, the uh, picture on the right is from a UAV. So 
is basically tub, sub 10 centimeter scale resolution. And then a lot of the science is also driven by climate change and how these systems are responding to climate change, both physiologically and then also at a regional scale. And so I just uh, want to sort of depict the history of kelp remote sensing in an art, art, more of an artistic perspective. So this is from Josie Eastland. She's an artist who uh, is also a kelp lover and sort of has gotten really into the science of kelp and marine algae. And she has been involved with mapping um, these systems and combining lots of different sources into more, more of an artistic, uh, through more of an artistic lens. So really, we still use all of these tools, in situ surveys from a boat, aerial surveys from a plane, satellite imagery such as Landsat, and now today we're using UAV imagery. And so really, these tools are all still important today, uh, even though they were historically developed um, and have been used for the, some of them have been used for the past hundred years. UAVs are just now a new toolbox in our, uh, uh, a new tool in our toolbox of remote sensing of kelp forests. So what do UAVs add to our toolbox? Uh, they have lots of advantages. Uh, one is that you can avoid heavy cloud cover that you can't with satellite imagery. Uh, flight timing can be flexible and allows mapping along complex coastlines. So that's complex coastlines present a much more uh, difficult task when using high, higher resolution satellite imagery. Um, and so UAVs get around that uh, by having a very high spatial resolution or the pixel size is very small. Uh, and then they're relatively inexpensive. You know, you can buy a Phantom 4 drone uh, for not very much and go out and map kelp forests uh, where you can't really launch your own satellite or most people can't. And uh, so this gives an avenue for people uh, who who really have no expertise in or, or history and remote sensing to go out and study these systems from a different perspective. And some disadvantages are that they can be logistically expensive to cover large regions. So Corey was talking about how they're covering these large-ish areas of intertidal uh, regions. And actually for kelp forests, it's kind of the opposite. Like you can't really cover as much with a drone as you can with a satellite. Um, but of course, in terms of in situ diver surveys and things like that, we're covering more. It also, you know, is technologically challenging. In some regards, there's additional software skill sets that need to be obtained in order to use the data. And then lots of permitting obstacles to go through, especially, uh, not especially, but in the marine environment, it's a little bit different uh, than uh, maybe from the terrestrial perspective. So then if we sort of think about spatial scales and we look at just a Phantom 4 image, uh, we see that a 30 by 30 meter spatial resolution, such as the Landsat pixel shown with this uh, yellow box here, basically incorporates half of the patch. So you're getting an idea of what, what kind of large scale may, patch dynamics might be going on. Uh, but then if we zoom in and maybe we're at one meter uh, or to three meter spatial resolution, this red box, then we're starting to see individual uh, plant dynamics. And then the green box, which is the drone pixel, we're starting to see individual blade characteristics. So each of these spatial resolutions allows us to sort of think about different problems and different scientific questions that we have um, in kelp forests. And this also translates to other uh, terrestrial systems as well. So then if we take uh, a similar approach that we looked at in the last slide, but instead of, in, instead of in a picture format, we're looking at actual satellite imagery. So the column on the left is all drone imagery, less than 10 centimeter resolution. And then we increase our spatial resolution as we go to the right. So three meter resolution, five meter resolution, 10 meter resolution, and 30. And these are from four different sites across the California coastline. 
And we can see that the patch dynamics are really apparent, the patch shape details are really apparent in the drone imagery, which is this panel here on the left. And then as we increase our spatial resolution, we start to not necessarily maybe be able to tell that that's a kelp patch, but we can detect that there is kelp there and, um, and can't necessarily get the same information from that pixel that we did at each of the different spatial resolutions. So this also leads us to consider sort of what is truth. And when we think about ground truthing, we think about going out and doing quadrat surveys or doing dive surveys and things like that. But uh, drones sample at approximately 10 or less centimeters and dive, dive surveys, you, you really can't sample at that resolution. So it starts to sort of beg the question, what is truth and how do we define that? And so when you look at surveys, so these grids are all the same uh, spatial, spatially. Uh, the green just represents dive surveys in a bicycle spoke pattern for each of the four sites that we were looking at on the last slide. And these dive surveys are at the same resolution as a five meter rapid eye. So I counted stipes within every single five uh, meters and then recorded that and then went to the next five meters and counted and the next and the next. So we're able to get a five meter spatial resolution uh, perspective from the diver survey. Um, and that took, you know, hours to collect one site. And so now I'm really interested in comparing those dive survey data to what we get from, for example, five meter spatial resolution rapid eye imagery. And then can we interpolate or understand the dive surveys in terms of this uh, 10 centimeter resolution drone imagery? So starting to think about what each of these sensors and scales tells us is really important, especially when there's either low biomass of kelp, like for example, you have one or two um, stipe or one or two plants in a, in a large pixel size, are you able to actually see that? And this is important for systems such as Northern California that have experienced uh, really rapid and uh, dramatic declines in kelp. And we're not sure at what resolution is the threshold for being able to detect it. We have about 30 seconds left. Oh, thank you. So I just briefly want to say that we're also, people are, are starting to use um, hyperspectral imagery in order to be able to understand more of that physiological perspective. So here, the lighter colored green actually represents senescing uh, kelp blades, and we get that from spectral information. So instead of it being like a multispectral five band sensor, we're getting lots and lots of different wavelengths that allows us to tease apart um, that more physiological uh, signature. And then just in terms of other applications of kelp ecology, you're going to hear about a high frequency time series from Hopkins in the next presentation. So it opens up avenues to more easily get data. Um, and then also looking at site specific surveys for restoration. And so you can get large areas covered for each site and look at how those sites change through time uh, based on recovery efforts that are made. And that was, uh, is one of the goals of the Nature Conservancy. And then in addition to kelp, lots of other marine and aquatic uh, applications uh, can be uh, applied with drones and either phytoplankton blooms or seagrasses are two really uh, emerging fields in marine uh, UAV uh, monitoring and, and measurements. So um, it's not just kelp, uh, and I just wanted to sort of like bring that to everyone's attention. But um, yeah, so thank you, and let me know if you have any questions.